Hey everybody, welcome to the Daily Check-In. I'm Ned Bellavance, Ned1313, and it is June 26, 2020. Welcome. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about HashiCorp Vault, the Vault certification, and specifically the first objective that's listed for the Vault certification, and we'll review what the sub-objectives are for that. I should be able to cover the whole thing in this one video, so that is my goal. That's what I want to get to, so I don't want to spend too much time on anything else. So there's no housekeeping items for this week. You know, like and share the channel, all that kind of good stuff. Not going to get into that. Uh, the other thing that I just want to mention is that uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, every day now has its own theme. So if you haven't caught up with that, just a quick reminder. Mondays are about professional development. Tuesdays are Terraform. Wednesdays are technical analysis. Thursdays are all about the edge. And Fridays, it's Vault. Okay, so with that, let's check in. How are you doing? I'm pumped. It's Friday. I'm going out to dinner tonight. Like, exciting things are happening. I, I hope exciting things are happening for you. I hope you're interested in Vault because I'm going to be talking about it every Friday. And uh, maybe that's exciting to you. And I'd highly recommend just delving in on your own and checking it out. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the first objective in HashiCorp Vault, the certification, I should say. So there are a whole bunch of objectives in the certification program. Uh, if I look at the current website, it looks like there are 10 objectives in total, and each one has one or more sub objectives within that larger objective. So those are all the, I call them enabling objectives. And then there's the terminal objective, the thing you actually want to do. What's the first objective? The first objective is authentication methods. Because if you think about it, if you want to use Vault at all, you need to authenticate to Vault and get yourself a token. If we're thinking about how Vault is structured, the token is basically everything. When you spin up a development instance of Vault Server or a production instance of Vault Server, it's going to give you a root token. And that root token can do anything. And it's really the only time you don't have to authenticate to Vault. It gives you that token to get started. But beyond that, you have to set up some sort of authentication mechanism to get new tokens to do things. And basically, a token is tied to an identity, it has a policy applied to it, or generally has a policy, or it gets the default policy. And the policy defines what that token is able to do. And the token also has a lease, it has a duration of time for which it's valid. So in order to get one of these tokens, you have to set up an authentication method to do that. So that is probably one of the most key things to understand about this. Now, there are a whole bunch of different authentication methods. And I did kind of want to dive into them a little bit. But first, let's examine what the enabling objectives are for this larger understanding authentication methods objective. So the first one is describe authentication methods. So we just did that we talked about it a little bit, what is an authentication method, it's a way for vault to verify your identity and then issue you a token based off of the identity you've submitted. Now there, are, like I said, there's a bunch of different authentication methods. And I believe the, the first one that it starts you out with, if you're going through the learn process, is either the username and password authentication method, or the GitHub authentication method. So either one's pretty straightforward to set up. You're basically with the username and password, it's not referring to an outside source for the authentication, you're literally enabling it and then adding users and giving them a password within the context of vault. So if someone wants to authenticate to vault, all they do is submit a username and password, and then vault gives them a token back. Now those users can be associated with one or more policies in vault. And those policies determine what those users are able to do. There's also a thing called the default policy that gets applied. And the default policy has some default things that a user could do. And you can edit that default policy to whatever you want it to be. Policies are a whole other section. So I don't want to dive into that too much. But just understand that once you've authenticated and gotten your token, you probably have a policy as well that defines what you can do. Now within the configuration of those authentication methods, you can specify how long the lease is for the token that gets issued by that method. 
So you can say, if I log in through username and password, my token's only good for an hour. And then if I want to keep interacting with Vault, I need to authenticate again. What are some other authentication methods you might want to know about it? Well, that leads us very nicely into the second enabling objective, which is choose an authentication method based on a use case. So a use case is probably going to inform what kind of authentication method you want to use. Let's say that all of your users have an Active Directory account. You might want to leverage Active Directory as your authentication mechanism and just tell Vault, hey, trust Active Directory to do the authentication. And in that case, you would enable not the Active Directory method, but the LDAP method because it supports more than just Active Directory. And then you'd have to set up the whole configuration of that method. By the way, you should know how to enable an authentication method at the command line. And the command is very simple. I'm not going to go through it here. It's just like vault auth enable and then the name of the method and then the path where you want it mounted. If you don't give it a path, it uses the name of the method as the path. So it would just be LDAP would be the path to it. Once you've enabled an authentication method, the next step is to configure that authentication method. It needs some information about how it should go about functioning. So in the Active Directory instance, you need to tell it, hey, how can I get in touch with an LDAP server or an Active Directory domain controller to perform the authentication? And I also need some credentials potentially to talk to that LDAP server if you don't allow unauthenticated access to that server. And it's probably also going to, going to want to know how to find users within the catalog of Active Directory. Within that catalog, you're going to have an OU structure. Which OUs should it use to look for users that are part of Vault? And also for groups. The other thing you can do is you can assign roles within Active Direct within Vault that map to certain groups in Active Directory. So if I log in and I'm a member of the developers group, then I will get the policy that is associated with that role. So there's a lot of configuration that should happen after you've enabled an authentication method. So that's one potential use case. What's another potential use case? You could say that you're, uh, let's see, let's look through the, what, what do I have here? You are an AWS shop and you would like people to dynamically be able to generate AWS credentials and then remove those credentials after a certain period of time. You could enable the AWS authentication method and in the same vein, you now have to configure it to interact with your AWS account. When you do that, what's really cool is when a person goes and authenticates, actually, no, that's, I'm thinking of completely the wrong thing. <laughs> thinking of secrets. That's dynamic secrets. We're talking about authentication. See how easily this sort of thing can be confused. So there is an AWS authentication method as well. And if you wanted to use the AWS authentication method, it's basically looking at I am to see if you are you have the appropriate permissions. And this can both be for I am stuff like users, it could also be for an I am role that's been assigned to an EC2 instance. So either of those could use that authentication method. It's a pretty interesting way to go about things. So if you're heavily an AWS shop and you want to use that as your authentication source, you can absolutely do that. If you're a heavy Microsoft Azure and Azure AD shop, you can use the Azure authentication method to do your authentication. And there's a bunch of other ones that are all dependent on use case. So be aware of the engines. You don't need to know how to configure every single one for the certification. That's not what they're going for. What they are going for is understand which authentication methods are out there and how do you select one given a particular use case, which takes us to our final enabling objective, which is differentiate between human versus system authentication methods. Now, what they're really trying to say here is some authentication methods are going to be interactive in nature. That username and password one, for example, uh, the LDAP one is probably going to be interactive, meaning you have to log in with your credentials and then it will issue you a token. But there will be times where it's not a human being logging in. Sometimes it's going to be a system or a machine that's logging in and it's not going to want that interactive level. It might want something that's a little more rapid 
or a little more automated. Now, there are authentication methods that serve that end a little bit better. One of them is called app roll. So you should probably know what app roll is and how it works. Another good example is Kubernetes. There is a Kubernetes authentication mechanism, which means that pods could use the uh, service account associated with them to authenticate to Vault via Kubernetes. So knowing that that's available is probably pretty important, and you might get a use case that specifies that. So understanding that sometimes it's a human logging in and sometimes it's a computer, the computer is not going to want to go through an interactive login process. It's going to want to do things very rapidly. That's the expectation. So for those, I would know about app role. I would know about the Kubernetes one, and I would probably know about the JWT slash OIDC one, which is a lot of letters that sound just like I jumbled them together, but it's basically the JSON web token and the OIDC, which I don't remember what that stands for, but it's basically a standardized identification provider mechanism. So that is the first terminal objective for the vault certification. Hopefully I've sparked some things for you. I would still highly recommend going through the learn process uh, that's on the HashiCorp website, or if you're feeling saucy, you can go to Pluralsight and I've got two vault courses on there. I would take the first vault course and that will get into these authentication methods. So that's what I have. That's all I got for this week. I am done. I am ready for the weekend. I will be back fresh and full of life on Monday to talk about professional development. If you have a topic that you want me to talk about, please reach out. It's Ned1313 on Twitter. It's Ned Bellavance on LinkedIn, or you can leave a comment with this video. And until next time, stay healthy and stay safe, everybody. Thanks.